Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Muddy Outdoors, Fuse Accessories, Frigid Forage, Trophy Rock, Scott Archery, Cabela's, Rocket Broadheads, Execute Scent Control, Bloodsport Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Scent Master, Yeti Coolers, Quiet Cat, Non-Typical Wildlife Solutions, Deer Grow, and Nikon. Welcome to the first episode of Midwest Whitetail Off-Season for 2015. On this episode we're going to talk about two subjects. Uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, throwing it over to Jim Reiser here in a little bit. He's going to talk about predator trapping, focusing primarily on coyotes, um, why you do it and how you do it. And uh, if you followed us last year, you know that Jim's he's gotten really good at catching coyotes. So we're going to uh, have a little bit of predator trapping here in a little bit. Uh, but first, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the evolution of tree stand locations. And in this case, uh, if you go back to where I spent most of my season uh, during 2014, I was in this redneck blind behind me, focused on trying to kill a buck that we had nicknamed Lucky. Uh, unfortunately, Lucky never showed up and we never got any pictures of him after the season. So I don't even know if he's still alive. But what we learned from all those hours in that redneck blind was how the deer sort of behaved in this area. And they didn't do exactly what I thought they were going to do. I thought they were going to pop out on that end, or they were going to come from the timber on this side and work their way through this food plot and use it more like a travel route. But what happened was a lot of the deer actually spent their time on that end of the food plot and they crossed over there a lot. So our job now is to try to dissect this situation based on what we learned, uh, what I learned from this past season, and come up with a better stand location or at least an alternative stand location for this coming season. And you always try to do that. Uh, great stand locations evolve. Rarely do you go into a spot based on scouting or looking at your aerial photos and pick the perfect tree that ends up being the perfect tree forever. Usually you get into the right area and it takes several hunting seasons before you get that perfect tree. Uh, we thought this was the spot, uh, but after this past hunting season, I think there's a better spot. So we're gonna go dive into that right now and uh, we'll come back again and we'll catch up with Jim. Okay, now we're on the other end of the same food plot. This is where the action was taking place mostly last season. And uh, my goal in today's scouting session is to pick, I've got two spots in mind. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a little discussion about why I'm gonna have a blind off to my left here. Then I'm gonna also talk about trying to find the perfect tree uh, for morning hunts. This area worked really well in the afternoons, decent in the mornings, but really in the mornings you'd like to be closer to bedding areas or at least in the cover near travel routes, afternoons near food. I'll start by talking about this location to my left. Um, and this would be within, oh, right where I'm standing now is about 30 yards, 35 yards to where that big scrape was underneath that tree. And the deer would come out of that trail straight in front of me. They'd come out of there and they would circle around this really heavy thicket in front of me and they would pop back into the timber again. Lots of deer made that loop back and forth. We would see them for a little while, then they'd be gone. And they never came on the other end of, that, of the food plot. So we know they were cutting across and going into the timber here somewhere. So my first thought is we need a blind here uh, so that we can get in here and hunt this thing in the evenings where we're closer to where the deer are coming out. So I've got a redneck blind on a trailer. So my thought is plant this to corn again, but first have that redneck blind pushed right up next to that walnut tree right here. So that's our, our first plan. Get the blind on the trailer, tucked in here before the planting season. But uh, we're gonna focus then on finding this perfect tree and uh, what I really think the deer are doing, they're coming out of here, like I said, in front of me, going around this thicket, and then just circling it, and then heading back in the same direction that they came from, but on the other side of the thicket. And there's a ditch. Uh, this, whole, this whole thing is a draw to my left, and there's a ditch at the bottom. So someplace down there, there's gonna be a, a place where the deer are crossing that ditch. There should be a real heavy crossing, and then where they pop up on the other side, come up, coming up out of the ditch, uh, we should be able to set up there so that's what we're going to go look at now. Uh, we, we, will, we will bring that to you uh, all the way through to completion of picking out the tree. Uh, I don't know what's in there. I, I can't say I've ever even scouted it, but uh, that's what I think is going on. So we're going to take a look right now and see if that's the case. 
this is pretty much what I was looking for right here. You can see the classic ditch funnel. And uh, if you hunt broken terrain a lot, uh, today's lesson might be more about how to use terrain to find travel routes and it will be about which exact tree I'm gonna put my stand in. But you can see the ditch is really deep here. And here it's really gradual. I mean, I can step over this thing no problem at all. It's only about six inches deep. Well, right there, it starts dropping off. And over here, it's probably about 10, in, or 10 feet deep. So the deer are gonna go around that. They're not gonna to try to jump that thing and they're not gonna go through it unless they're pushed. Uh, that's natural movement. The deer are gonna take that path of least resistance and that's gonna be around the end of the ditch. So this is what I was looking for. I didn't know this was here, which is you know, probably surprising, but I haven't scouted every corner of this farm. And the next step here for me now is uh, uh, trying to figure out the deer coming off that field. That's the food plot right above me, only 45, 50 yards away up on top of this ridge. They're coming down through here and they're gonna go somewhere. But this is not a bad spot, really. I mean, it's not super deep here where we're gonna get a lot of wind swirl. I mean, this, this uh, valley is probably only 20 feet deep and it's not very wide. But let's keep going and keep scouting and we'll come back to this spot and talk some more. You probably think I never left this spot, but I'm back here again for the third time this is the magic spot on this part of the farm. Uh, there's no sign that, that there's any real consistent movement pattern going back into the cover again that we would say was made during the rut. So the deer that we were seeing were coming right through here. So the trick now, and I've spent a lot of time looking up because it's a little bit perplexing, unfortunately. The trick is finding the right tree uh, to be able to hunt this spot effectively. So you want to be on that side of it, and we can hunt that pretty well because that, that direction is west. So anything out of the west or out of the northwest would really work well here. We just don't have a tree in the right spot. Um, you run into that a lot, and, and you have to find some compromise to make it work. Uh, a lot of times there's trade-offs in the trees that you end up having to pick. I want to look at this for a little bit longer. We've got a shingle oak tree that's only about eight yards away. It's not a real big tree. It's a little bit too close. Uh, the next best option is going to be one of these cedar trees. And there's one over there that's about 20 yards away that might work. Uh, right over there, 25 yards, that one might work. Um, I'm going to look a little bit longer right here before I decide on a tree. I mean, that, that cedar tree right there is too close. Yeah. I and mean, I think it's going to be that one. I made my decision. I'm just a little short ways away from the crossing. That shingle oak tree I was talking about is right here. And it's just too small. Uh, there's, there's enough additional trails kind of all coming in together here and one from behind me that there'd be, there'd be too much deer activity too close to that little bitty tree. So I'm going to have to step back a little bit further than I wanted to and uh, I'm not going to be able to keep every single trail on the upwind side. I'm going to go up to that cedar tree which you can see part way up the hill. That'll give me a 25 yard shot to the crossing. Uh, should be able to have pretty decent angles there for a broadside shot. And that'd give me about probably a similar, you know, probably a 25 to 30 yard shot to the field edge. So, like I said, there's usually some type of a trade off or a compromise that you have to make when you can't find the perfect tree, unfortunately. But we're going to be in that tree. So, come back again next week and we'll go through the whole process of figuring out exactly where in the tree to put the stand. Uh, talking about heights, tree stand heights, how much uh, cover to cut, you know, how many, you know, how big to make your shooting lanes. So, uh, so far I've got this one nailed down, I think. I'm pretty excited about it because I think this is going to be a great morning spot during the rut. We're going to jump to Jim Reiser now and talk about trapping coyotes. This is Jim Reiser for Midwest Whitetail, and I'm going to be taking you through my trapping season this year. I have a new property to trap because I've got a friend who has problems with coyotes and some fox and he really wants as many egg eaters off of his property as possible. Now this property that I'm trapping on is a really nice natural funnel. It sits on 80 acres of land and the woods is right back behind a creek uh, area. Uh, the creek comes right at the very base of his property so it's a natural funnel for game to come underneath the bridge or perhaps on one side of the street to the other from one wooded area to the other to go right alongside this field or actually right inside the woods. So one of the first places I want to put my traps is right in that area where those funnels meet. Then as you can see in the aerial view, 
you can get an idea of how these woods work and then as we walked alongside of the woods you can see the game trails themselves and the game trails themselves are very telling um, quite frankly if you've got something where there's logging trails or if there are four-wheeler trails or game trails themselves you can put your traps right along those edges there and you may use a dirt hole set you may use a flat set or you may use a signpost set um, and I'm going to take you through all three of those along with the kinds of traps that I use. I have two basic trap sets that I'm using this year. I have the one that was kind of my beginner set. And this is a Bridger. And this is a Bridger number two. But uh, these are good traps and some of the features on the traps. This is the dog. This is what actually holds the trap open when you open the jaws here. This is a uh, single coil trap. You can see here the coils and um, a double coil trap have coils of springs on this side of the trap as well and that makes the trap uh, work better in winter conditions where there might be some ice. The Bridger number two is um, nice uh, for a beginner set um, but I'll tell you something um, I've upgraded to these Minnesotas this is a Minnesota 550 in my hand here and it has um, a wider jaw. In Indiana we have to have offset jaws to be legal. We can't have closed jaws. So check your trap regulations so that you have the right sized trap as well as the jaws that are um, legal in your state. Uh, the Minnesota is a little bit of a hardier trap and uh, has a little bit of a different latching system. It's got what's called night latched and I'll explain that here in a few minutes. But I also have a Bridger one and three quarter set, and that's a great set for fox. Um, my hope is to get some fox this year. Um, I've gotten some coyotes, I've gotten tons of possum, which by the way, if you're a turkey hunter, take your possums, take your raccoons, take anything that eats eggs out of the mix. Um, I got 14 coyotes off of my property in Reelsville two years ago, and I have yet to have any coyote issues. My turkey population has a Improved dramatically. My fawn uh, production rate has improved dramatically. Um, even with the EHD, I noticed a lot more does this year. So um, this next couple of years really will be telling on what's going on with the coyote population over at my farm. The areas that I look for when I'm setting a trap are, again, game trails, brush, and I want to have somewhere where coyotes or fox or whatever the game that I'm trying to trap are going on a natural basis. Um, so when you're hunting, uh, especially during season when you're in your deer stands, watch where those coyotes are coming out of and watch where they're going. Look for their escape routes as well. Anywhere where you see a game, you are going to have a place to trap. And again, these animals do the same thing that deer do and the same thing that we do. They take the road of least resistance. So definitely don't be worried about being too close to the road or being too close to a trail itself. If this is an unused logging trail, perfect place to have your trap sets. Most of the game are going to be cruising around and our hope is, is that those coyotes or those fox or even the possums and the raccoons are going to smell what they're uh, passing by and get enough of their attention to where they're going to go back and check it out. Now I'm trapping in a suburban area and uh, I've been using this Ruger 1022 for the past three years. And this is really nice because this is my 22. This is the gun that I use to take uh, my game with. Um, it's real simple. I'll show you how to set it up. And um, it's a takedown. And it's very easy because uh, two reasons that I use this particular gun, especially in suburban areas and even in urban area, is um, because it's a quiet, 22 is quiet. You're not gonna be much further than 10 yards away from the game that you're gonna be killing and they're already in the trap. And then the other thing is, uh, it's not obvious that you're carrying a gun on a property. With the 1022, it's that easy to put together. Cock it, get ready to go, do your thing, bam, and you're finished. And that's a really nice feature in having this as well because again, you know, a lot of people aren't real fond of trapping Charlie Mashik and Justin Jett over at Hoosier Trapper Supply have helped me so much with understanding um, how best to dispatch the coyote, how best to dispatch um, 
the fox and the raccoons. Uh, right behind the ear on a raccoon uh, and a possum, those things take forever to die, but right behind the ear is a really good place to dispatch. And then right between the eyes on the other animals, because the other thing that's nice about using a 22 is that that causes minimal fur damage if you're into catching fur. With regard to quality of pelt, with coyotes, it's not nearly as pleasing to the eye to have red in it, so they look for silver or black. And I've got a few pelts out of the 14 that I trapped a couple of years ago. I've got three really super, super high quality pelts. And I actually paid to have them tanned, and they did what's called a tube skinning, where they skin the entire coyote, but they don't cut any of the skin itself. And it's a real pretty, nice, completely uh, supple coat. Um, that right now I'm just using for display, but I may opt to use them at some point. With fox pelts, um, you're looking for, as far as quality is concerned, looking for those dark, dark, dark legs and dark tail. Uh, the the um, juvenile fox and the young fox uh, have a tendency to be more red all over. So uh, you're looking to get the best quality pelt. If you are a pelt guy, you can get 70 to 80 to 150 bucks on a pelt. So. You know, trapping can pay for itself. Um, I'm not really that much about pelts. I'm really into getting them trapped, getting a couple of mounts out of them because I find them to be absolutely beautiful. But for the most part, uh, I'm not going to be selling anything. I'm just interested in getting them off the farm. I made it back to the truck here right by the redneck blind and uh, feel pretty good about that spot that we found. This is the time of year to do this type of work. But uh, we'll be back again next week talking about exactly how to put that stand in. We'll probably have some shed hunting for you. So we'll bring it all to you with the next episode. So come back and join us again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. And remember to always dream big.